Hello, everyone. I'm so very grateful to be here in the company of so many distinguished Herodotians, especially as an early career researcher. I really enjoyed the helpline so, so much. It's, it's really exciting to think about Herodotus from uh, such a diverse array of perspectives and in relation to such a rich variety of traditions, intertexts, and fields of inquiry. Today, I'm excited to present on some of the Herodotian aspects of my current research project, which stems from my recent dissertation on influences of Achaemenid historiography on the Greek historians of Persia. My apologies go to John Dillery, who's here and who served on my committee and to whom my arguments will already be familiar. Thus far, I've examined Xenophon's Anabasis, Theseus's Persica, and of course, Herodotus's histories to search for traces in these Greek historians' works of what I regard as signature forms of Achaemenid Persian engagement with history. History defined as the treatment of past, present, and as we will see, future time. The idea for such an investigation is not a new one, but ultimately derives from, from, from some preliminary observations made by Arnaldo Mamiliano now 60 years ago. In spite of the Herodotian legacy of separating the European West from an Orientalized East with echoes up to the present day, the artificiality of such a boundary was highlighted already by Mamiliano. His early interest in intellectual and cultural transfer across geographical boundaries, including from the Persian Empire to Greece, uh, paved the way for the sort of interdisciplinary cooperation that characterizes the new and burgeoning field of Achaemenid studies and indeed a modern flood of connectivity studies on the ancient world more broadly. Emiliano was specifically interested in the Persian Empire's effects on the emergence of history writing in Greece and in Yehud. Here it will be useful to review some observations made first in his 1961 to 1962 Sather lectures and again in 1965. In these contributions, he pointed to several traits of post-Persian War Greek and post-exilic Jewish historiography which he regarded as departures from previous modes of representing and accounting for the past among the ancient Greeks and Jews respectively. Among these novel features were several that characterized Achaemenid Persian and other ancient Near Eastern historiography and record keeping, such as an awareness of quote, elements of Eastern and particularly Persian storytelling or narrative techniques, an autobiographical style, and some degree of influence exerted by the bureaucratic and archival habits of the Achaemenids. While these characteristics amount to positive influences on the beginnings of history writing in Greece and Yehud, Mamiliano posited that both historiographical traditions independently represent a reaction against the Persian Empire. My project picks up the thread of, Mamil of Mamiliano's early sketches and elucidates more fully, and with the benefit of scholarly insights from the intervening 60 years, some of the ways in which the first Greek historians, and particularly the Greek historians of Persia, were influenced by Persian intellectual systems for figuring the past. Even today, there is often a tendency to treat the emergence of history writing as a distinctively Greek phenomenon, as another aspect of the so-called Greek miracle. And it is true that explicit methodological self-reflection first occurs in Greek writings about the past. On the other hand, as Momiliano emphasized, this genre develops in the context of interactions with the Achaemenid Persian Empire. Since all we have left is official, that is to say, imperially sanctioned historiographical depictions from the Achaemenid Persians themselves, my project necessarily engages with Persian imperial ide ideology and its Greek receptions. In that respect, my methods are often similar to those of our own Tom Harrison's analysis of Herodotus's engagement with Achaemenid imperial propaganda. I reach similar conclusions to Tom about the Greek historian's awareness, historicization, and problematization of original Persian materials with their imperialist orientation. But my study focus, focuses specifically on the Achaemenid management of history. This possibility has been relatively ignored in previous literature, probably because of the timeless ahistorical quality frequently emphasized in treatments of Achaemenid royal inscriptions after Darius's text at Visitun. I argue that this timelessness can be more usefully analyzed as a presentist and future-oriented temporality, and that such an orientation is just as constitutive and characteristic of Achaemenid historiography as are Achaemenid depictions of the past. Because of the eschatological pretensions of Achaemenid imperialism, the ideological management of present and future temporalities and their connection to enduring empire is as necessary for official propaganda as is the management of the past. The Greek historians of Persia then, writing at various stages, not only of Persian political influence in Greece, 
but also in the context of variously successful Athenian and then Panhellenist imperial initiatives, witnessed the disconnect between some of these presentist claims with their attempt to efface or to freeze diachronic development and change, and the actual unfolding of events and vacillation of political fortunes despite these claims. My approach also owes much to the influential 1994 study of Matthew Christ, whom we heard from recently, and whose seminal article demonstrated the ways in which Herodotus's Eastern kings make scientific, ethnographical, and historiographical inquiries, sometimes with methods similar to Herodotus's own. Jonas Brethlein used this article as a starting point for his own 2009 contribution, in which he analyzes the problematic historiographical practice which Herodotus attributes to King Darius and Xerxes. While I have benefited from Christ's and Grethlein's insights, my study expands on their findings insofar as it approaches the Persian kings and their history writing directly in order to evaluate their reception, not merely as a literary construction in Herodotus's text, but as a common intellectual thread in multiple Greek engagements with Persian kings over time, that is persisting uh, beyond Herodotus through Ctesias and Xenophon's depictions of the empire, their, organi their organization of the Persian past and present, and the representations of the king's efforts to make historical claims. In my overarching research project then, I posit a dialogue between Greek and Persian historians rather than a monologic one-way directionality. Rather than seeking to compile a comprehensive account of all Persian inputs into the emerging Greek historiography, I have thus far, thus far been concentrating on three distinct intellectual and organizational strategies which the Achaemenids used in their imperial propaganda and historiography, and which Greek historians responded to in their writings. The following tendencies, which I identify, were originally inspired by Momiliano's categories, but they've morphed into new categories as my research has proceeded. I'd like to preview these now before we look in more detail at the Achaemenid sources which exhibit these tendencies. They are, first, a rigorous Achaemenid habit of listing or charting imperial holdings, resources, even peoples and lands subject to the empire in a mode that virtually reflects the robustness of the extensive bureaucracy which the Achaemenids used to control such a vast territory for so long. This mode is exemplified by the content and form of the tablets that constitute the Persepolis fortification archive with their documentation of the distribution of rations to entities as diverse as units of cortage, which is the Elamite word for corvée laborers, and the allotment for the royal table. The Greek historians, I argue, are intrigued by the utility of the chart as an organizational method and they experiment with it in their treatments of the Persian Empire. On the other hand, they associate, they associate it strongly with the intellectual and imperial activities of the Persian kings, and sometimes react against its uses as a tool of empire. This is especially true of Herodotus. The charting habit, which is best suited to written communication, coexists robustly with oralistic discursive modes, even an insinuation of oral performance, both in texts like the Bicetone inscription and in the Greek historian's texts. The second category I'd like to highlight is a Achaemenid attempts at representing and consolidating empire via physical monuments. This category is worth consideration in part because the historical narratives which the Achaemenids themselves left us were inscribed in monumental form. I argue that the Greeks recognized that Achaemenid monuments, their art and architecture, uh, were designed to recall and compete with previous regional exemplars. For example, Egyptian or Babylonian monuments that they were designed to commemorate a current array of imperial resources with implications for expected, expected longevity. And they were designed to permeate the consciousness of imperial subjects by means of broad dissemination, especially in the format of coins, which carried the emblematic likeness. From the Greek perspective, however, these ideological projects did not always succeed. Today, I will only have time to touch on the tendency to commemorate resources rather than deeds. The third phenomenon I would point to is the rhetorical posture and self-authorization of the Achaemenid kings as historiographers, specifically the tendency to intertwine their roles as king, judge, and historian in order to enunciate normative historical narrative from the top down. At the same time, these top-down pronouncements are frequently tailored to harmonize with local conventions and expectations, including the implotment of historical narrative onto existing story templates. The King's habit of rigorous ethnographic investigation enables the successful production of this sort of locally inflected historiography. Mastery of such a multiplicity of discourses and their regional implementation is accomplished, moreover, by the delegation of the task of enunciating, or the, at the very least communicating, history to the King's proxies, such as satraps. Greek historians recognize these distinctive aspects of the King's historiography 
and they occasionally engage in tantalizingly similar processes, particularly at the juncture of ethnography and moral judgment about the past. At the same time, however, they highlight and implicitly criticize the disingenuous and obscurantist uses to which Persian kings or pretenders to the Persian throne put these strategies, as well as these methods associations with imperial ambition, expansionism, and control. As much as I would love to workshop these ideas with you all today, it won't be possible in the space of this talk to provide you with examples of this aspect of a committed historiography or with Herodotus' engagement with it. The idea that the historical project of Herodotus in particular constitutes a means of resisting Persian imperial expansion is not new. Pascal Payen, for instance, treated Herodotus's narrative with its geographic and ethnographic expositions as a means of virtually slowing down the Persian king's advance in the text. Breathline, for his part, has demonstrated that the historian's narrative defies the Persian king's attempts to freeze time with their premature commemorations of deeds or processes that are still in progress by revealing how the eventual outcomes of, the, of these events, for example, the dismantling of a monumental inscription, contradict or even undo the king's historical claims. The anti-imperialist reading of Pan can be coordinated with Grethlein's analysis of heredity and experimentation with diachrony in order to explore the possibility that self-conscious analytical history writing develops among, among the Greeks not only as a new application of rational inquiry and the natural sciences to the study of the past, also as a, as a specific response to static or future-oriented temporal regimes that are asserted as an accessory of imperialist geopolitical control. These meditations on temporalities and the ways in which they interact with both empire and with historiography are an undercurrent worth keeping in mind as we survey Herodotian engagements with Persian materials. My primary focus for today, however, is on elucidating specific Persian intellectual strategies adopted and or problematized by Herodotus as a Greek historian of Persia. I hope that my observations may help to shed a different light on the origins of historiography as a medium both in the service of and, and in opposition to various imperialisms, and also as a genre between East and West, as much as a distinctive Greek intellectual product. So then what are our Persian historiographical sources? As I have already implied, Achaemenid historiography is often regarded as a contradiction in terms. The kings of Persia are frequently characterized as largely failing to, to document imperial time and record imperial deeds. In contrast to other kingdoms or empires of the ancient Near East, we have no Achaemenid royal annals, though Ctesias alleges that there were Basilikai Diphtheri or Basilikai Anagraphi, which he consulted for his Persica, and the Book of Esther contains an anecdote that the king had royal records read out to him at bedtime when he was unable to sleep. Our main source for official Persian engagements with pastime is the corpus of monumental royal inscriptions, most famously Darius the Great's inscription at Mount Besatun, in which he narrates at length his rightful accession to the Persian throne after expelling the false claimant Gamata, also known as Smerdis in Greek, a story that we know from book three of the histories. Other royal inscriptions describe building projects, such as Darius the Great Stele at the Suez Canal or his foundation charter for a palace at Susa. Another pervasive type of inscription consists of lists of the peoples or lands embraced by the Achaemenid Empire. We have examples of these lists from Darius the Great and from Xerxes. With the exception of the Bissetun inscription and the rather brief notices of completed, of completed building projects, the Persian kings do not narrate their past deeds. And even the Bissetun inscription has been shown to move away from rigorous documentation of the past over the course of its several years of coverage. There's also apparently no courtly apparatus to perform this function, nor is there evidence of large scale prose history writing on the part of private citizens, no Persian Herodotus or Thucydides. I leave to one side the question of poetic oral traditions about kings, such as they surface later on in the Shaknameh, or the existence of oral traditions in prose, which Helene Sanchezi Werdenberg posited. I'm specifically interested in the phenomenon of history writing. I've just told you that the Achaemenid kings did not in general write extended narratives about the past, but I nevertheless, nevertheless argue that their attempts to give programmatic shape to present time and future time represent a positive historiographical stance and a meaningful attempt to dictate imperial temporality. First, let's look at the chart. One avenue of Persian influence, which Mamiliano pointed to, is the bureaucratic documentary habits of the Achaemenids. Let's first look at Herodotus' experimentation with the primarily scribal, that is, written form of what I'm calling the chart. I provisionally defined the chart as a documentary list with headings and an explicit summation 
for example, as some total of all items under one heading. Herodotus engages with the chart as a strategy for organizing and presenting information, and one that is strongly associated with a Achaemenid bureaucracy. I analyze instances of a documentary chart as a specific subtype of list, as distinct from lists that A, do not categorize their own contents according to one or more headings, whether these are actually inscribed at the head of a column or attached discursively to the list in question, and B, do not culminate in some sort of summary, usually a sum total of the entries under one or more headings. For Umberto Eco, lists in general are characterized by their capacity for open-endedness and infinite extendability. What I'm calling the chart, by contrast, is a self-contained, closed entity whose finitude precisely suits it for bureaucratic and administrative use, since it functions as descriptive documentation whose summation is more important than its component parts. For example, the total sum of tribute at the end of an annual chart of individual contributions is the salient culminating data point from a chart whose headings might be imperial principalities and amount paid. The chart then is a utilitarian subtype of list and one whose potential is most fully exploited when it is written down and available to reference. For the chart as an administrative in instrument, I adduce the receipts that make up the Persepolis fortification archive texts, which document the movements and apportionment of rations throughout the Persian Empire. The mentality of the chart is evinced in the presentation of information both within a given document and across documents. Within single documents, we might find lists that correlate one category of quantitative and qualitative information, for example, the number of units of a certain commodity, with one or more separate categories, for example, the number of people to whom that quantity was distributed, further sub subcategorization of those people as man or woman, adult or child, parent of a male child, parent of a female child. Often, a summary total of quantities is involved. So for example, Persepolis Fortification Tablet 1236 charts the quantities of two different types of grain allotted to mothers of boys and to mothers of girls, along with the total amount of each type of grain and the total number of mothers. This chart is written in continuous prose, but look how easily this information can be captured graphically in what we might more normally think of as a chart or a table. The tendency to organize by headings also lends itself to the typological similarity of entire classes of document. In other words, different texts which register the same type of transaction conform to a sort of expected overarching template for the categories of information which they report. So for example, they're expected to give such information as amount of a given foodstuff, the name of the official who supplied it, name of the official who received it, the pur purpose for which it was used, date of the transaction. Not only is the chart a signature form of the day-to-day -day secretarial apparatus of a Kemenid imperial administration, but it's also sufficiently pervasive as to feature in official historiography. Its organizational and representational strategies are co-opted for the state-sanctioned historiographical production of a Kemenid scribes under Darius I. The mentality and form of the chart underlies the presentation of materials in what we might call the summary portions of the text of the Byzantine inscription. At section 52 of this inscription, Darius recapitulates the names, for example, Asina here, uh, the ethnicities, Asina is an Elamite, the royal claims or lies. So Asina lied, he spoke thus, I am king in Elam. And uh, the sites of the rebellions, so Asina made Elam rebellious. Uh, for the nine rebels or liars whose revolts had been treated one by one in the foregoing campaign narrative section of the text. This concluding section caps off that narrative by collecting these salient categories of information into a unitary chart whose headings are made explicit in summary notices that occur immediately before and after the list. So he says, I smote them and seized nine kings. So he, he tells us that there's gonna be nine people. Uh, and these are the nine kings whom I seized in these battles. So again, uh, nine kings is a heading. And these are the lands which became rebellious. So another heading for, the, for this chart. For another instance of the chart form, we may compare Darius's six followers listed at section 68, where each entry of the list consists of personal name, father's name, and ethnicity, which in all case, cases is Persian, but nevertheless, it's explicitly spelled out for each of the six. After the Byzantine inscription, Darius's official propaganda continues to make use of this strategy and to exploit its capacity for serving as an index of organizational control. Bryce's foundation deposits at Susa chart the provenance of materials used in the construction of the Apadana 
and the ethnicities of specialist craftsmen who worked those materials. Having defined the chart and contextualized its prolific use in Achaemenid imperial administration and, historic, and official historiography, I argue that Herodotus evinces some sort of awareness of the bureaucratic chart as an organizational form, and that he regards it as typically Persian. Because of the constraints of time, I'd like to offer here just one example of Herodotus's experimentation with Persian charts, namely Darius's tribute list at uh, histories 389 to 397. This list is strongly focalized as being an intellectual and administrative product of Darius himself at a specific moment in time, and as being exemplary of Darius as the proverbial shopkeeper or cafe loss of the state. In other words, the list Herodotus gives here is presented as if it were an authentic output of Persian bureaucratic administration under Darius. That Herodotus conceives of the list in this way is suggested by its placement after the, after the description of Darius's organizational reforms at 389, which prefigured the structure and the contents of the list. Herodotus insinuates that the list he gives is a reproduction of the direct results of Darius's process. Herodotus's seriated entries, explicitly headed with ordinal numbers, pick up the notice that Darius divided the empire into 20 archai, realms, each one characterized as a namas, or administrative district, for taxation purposes. The reader or audience is meant to understand that Herodotus's numbering has been taken over directly from, from Darius. The inclusion of the Persian word for arche, ar, sorry, the inclusion of the Persian word for the archai or namoi, that is satrapeii, satrapes, further, contribute, further contributes to this impression of Herodotus's source. The definition of each arche or namas, either in terms of its constituent peoples or its geographical boundaries, likewise is a direct reflex of Darius's organizational scheme as depicted by Herodotus. Finally, the presentation of amounts of tribute assessed for each district also conforms to the metrological standard set by Darius. Before and after the list, Herodotus provides his readers with the means to convert Eastern weights to more familiar Greek units and even performs some conversions for them. But within the catalog itself, he nonetheless chooses to record the tribute for, al for almost all entries in terms of the Babylonian silver talent instead of a Greek standard. Moreover, Herodotus's intervening remark that Darius was the first Persian king to exact the predetermined amount of tribute as opposed to gifts in kind indicates that the historian's interest in protoi heretai and in inventors can extend to the origins of a systematized bureaucratic practice. Comment about Darius's national evaluation as shopkeeper of the state suggests further that Darius's bureaucratic administrative approach to national government is the driving force behind the creation of the districts and ultimately the tribute list. The catalog is accordingly shaped in a way that Herodotus imagines to be the embodiment of such a mindset and method. The sensibility accounts for the structural coherence of the present catalog as a discursive strategy. The fact that it is by far the longest Herodotian list to use ordinal headings and the veneer of organizational streamlineness suggests by the relative simplicity of its contents, uh, which, which are the constituents of each, of each district, the amount of tribute, and Nelmas plus ordinal number. See also the paucity of explanatory authoria, authorial interventions and anecdotal material within this catalog itself. This structure is mirrored by Herodotus's characterization of his own list. These then were the districts and the impositions of tributes. Interestingly, extraneous or explanatory material does occur, but in a postscript to the ordered list, where Herodotus describes and accounts for various exceptions to the tributary system, specifically exemptions and, con and contributions in kind. Both the content and the form of these entries, or rather these appended non-entries, distinguishes them from the official list of 20. Rather than simply name each group in their customary payment, Herodotus appends uneven political, historical, and ethnographic commentary to them. These groups are listed organically and not seriated as in the foregoing chart. The diachronic considerations of some of these scholarly accretions also sets them apart from material allowed into the catalog proper. Herodotus's chart purports to represent an administrative reality at the specific moment of its establishment by Darius. So, uh, see these, these errors, Arkas Katistesatra and Ataxata Forus. Accordingly, subsequent additions to the tributary system do not intrude into the body of the document itself to take up a place as distinct entries in the catalog, but instead they're registered after Herodotus' calculation of the total annual tribute. <laughs> 
versus calculation of the This temporal specificity enhances the documentary pretensions of Herodotus', of Herodotus chart. Herodotus has managed to emulate a form which he conceives of as Persian and documentary, the product of a Persian bureaucracy put into place by Darius. External evidence, however, presents us with a disconnect between the data presented in that form and the facts on the ground. While no single extant Persian document lists districts and their assessed tribute, tribute documentary evidence suggests that some of Herodotus' groupings of people are incorrect and that he has gotten other details wrong. His source appears not to be inscriptional either. As others have noticed, Herodotus' catalog of tributary peoples does not correspond to any of the various inscribed lists of Darius, which explicitly enumerate the lands which bore him tribute. Herodotus, I'm claiming, purposefully replicates the documentary structure in the context of a discussion of bureaucratic innovation, but not the actual contents of any real document. Herodotus's conception of the place of such administrative looking data in his, in his historical overview may be hinted at in miniature by his intermittent habit of explicitly withholding reportive, reportage of information which he claims to have in hand. Let's look at one example. At 7224-1, Herodotus suppresses a list of names of the 300 Spartiates who died at Thermopylae, even though he specifically describes them as onomastoi, worth naming, and emphatically claims to have found out all of their names. The only name he provides in this context is that of Leonidas, set off from the rest by the description aner genomenos aristos, a man who proved best, and by the focalizing collocation, kai leonides te dot dot dot, kai heteroi metal to onomastoi spartiate on, both Leonidas and the rest of the name worthy Spartiates with him. While the illusion of this material makes good practical sense, insofar as a list of 300 personal names would be exceptional even for the histories, Herodotus's decision to call attention to the existence of such a list and his mastery of it is striking. Rather than rehearse all the names, Herodotus makes a qualitative judgment that simultaneously ranks Leonidas as Aristos and allows his name to stand in for all the other unnamed onomastoi spartiate on. The juxtaposition of an available data set that is dangled in front of and then explicitly withheld from the reader and Herodotus's self-conscious presentation of the most salient data point from the set suggests something about Herodotus' attitude towards the documentary lists which kings are able to produce. Pausanias tells us that the names of the 300 Spartiates were all recorded together on a stela. The act of collecting these names and the monumental format of their publication both suggest a top-down process of the coordination of physical and intellectual resources. In this respect, the list of names of the 300 is structurally similar to an imperial Persian list of military personnel. Herodotus's qualitative evaluation overrides the compulsion, often obeyed elsewhere, to reproduce a document in its entirety. I suggest provisionally that in suppressing such a document by means of superlative evaluation, of its contents, Herodotus is reacting against a quantitative character which he perceives in them. Now I'd like to move on to the last part of my talk in which I'd like to correlate this first habit of, a, of Achaemenid historiography and bureaucracy, the charting impulse, with another aspect of Achaemenid historiography with which Herodotus and other Greek historians likewise engage, namely Persian monumentality. For the sake of simplicity and time, I'm only going to address one characteristic quality of Achaemenid monuments. When Persian kings memorialize themselves, there's often a special emphasis on commemorating the quantity and quality of imperial resources, as well as the king's position of command over them. This theme of, quote, Persian over-reliance on resources and numbers, end quote, to use a phrase of Emily Greenwood, has been amply studied in the histories and variously coordinated with analysis of Herodotus's portrayal of Eastern or Persian morals as opposed to Greek, explorations of scientific and historical methodology, and problematization of historiographical practice, including monumental discourse. I'd like to expand on this last idea. In his narrative of Darius' Scythian campaign, Herodotus represents the great king as setting up a complex of monuments which feature variations on this message. In the first of these commemorations, twin stelae on the shore of the Bosporus served specifically to ossify an enumeration of all the peoples he led into combat, ethna alpanta hasa perega, at the beginning of of the expedition. Herodotus immediately qualifies that Darius led all the peoples whom he ruled, Ega de Panta ton Erha. In Herodotus's estimation, such uses for monumentality are historiographically suspect. The Persian king's focus on listing the resources at his command results in prospective commemoration that ends up being premature. 
Here I draw on the observations of Kreflein, who has demonstrated how Herodotus, Xerxes, and Darius inappropriately make historical judgments before the proper time. In this case, Kreflein views the bilingual format of Darius's Bosporus stelae as encoding an assertion of Persian control over Asia and Europe, but the eventual failure of the Scythian expedition demonstrates that this assertion is merely wishful thinking. At the same time that he illustrates the short-sightedness of the Persian king's efforts at memorializing themselves in terms of the resources at their command, Herodotus makes clear the type of data which he does consider viable for commemoration in stone. Darius's monumental program for the outset of the Scythian expedition is pointedly contrasted with the, with the accomplishments and the accompanying monuments of an Egyptian king who had also constructed stelae to memorialize his military campaigns abroad. At Histories 2, 1024. In contrast to Darius's message, the Egyptian pharaoh Sesostris' stelae emphasized with a retrospective vantage the Egyptian king's personal military accomplishment by recording both his own name and that of his country and how he had subdued them, that is, the people he defeated, by his own power. This notion of concrete achievement is reinforced by Sesostris' inscribed reproach to cities who did not put up a fight. This is in the next section. As, differenti as differentiated from those nations who offered him brave resistance on behalf of their own freedom. I should note here that Grefline already draws attention to this comparison, but his emphasis is on Darius's short-sighted commemoration of an event that is still in progress, whereas I additionally want to draw attention to the Persians' commemoration of resources as, a, as opposed to completed deeds. Herodotus goes beyond the implicit comparison of the commemorative stelae erected by these two kingly conquerors of peoples to register an explicit comparison between the resumes. At 2.110, he reports that the Egyptian priest at the sanctuary of Hephaestus refused to allow Darius to build a statue of himself in front of Sesostris' statue group there on the grounds that Sesostris had conquered more people than Darius, and in particular, Kai de Kai, the Scythians, the very object of the failed campaign that occasioned Darius's stelae. According to the priest of Hephaestus, it was not right, who de Kai on Ani, for Darius to interfere with the memorial of Sesostris, who had accomplished more than he. Amazingly, Darius responds by assenting to this curtailment of his intended monumental program. Uh, they say that Darius agreed in light of these arguments. Darius's leniency in this episode has long been understood as an index of the ideological orientation of Herodotus's source, anti-Persian, Egyptian, uh, proto-nationalist propaganda, possibly specific to the traditions and memories of a particular priesthood. Rather than merely reproducing any such attitudes, however, Herodotus has made a point of favorably contrasting the methodologically defensible historiographical practice of Sesostris with the misguided orientation of Darius's program. Herodotus's treatment of these two kings' stelae is all the more remarkable when we consider the fact that both historical figures are known to have employed the monumental rhetoric of list making. Sesostris, or Sawosit I, one of the historical prototypes for Herodotus' Sesostris, included a list of peoples on one of his monuments, which in fact was a stela. It is unclear whether Herodotus would have been aware of such a list or indeed of the Egyptian royal practice of listing peoples of which the Sostris the first stela appears to be the first extant instance. For Herodotus, list making as a form of imperial control and commemoration is typically Persian. Here it is useful to reflect on the ways in which the Herodotian depiction of Darius's Bosporus stelae accurately reflects certain ideological aspects of the historical Darius's official monumental program as preserved for us in textual format. The inscriptions that accompany Darius's palace at Susa focus on the subject peoples and material resources at the disposal of the great king, as well as on the divine authorization for such a relationship between the king and the empire's personnel and resources. The enumeration of regional contributions to the palace and the cataloging of lands subject to the empire in the Susa text and in the various, uh, various lists that we've already talked about as examples of charts, provides suggestive parallels to the inscriptional practice Herodotus attributes to Darius. This is, of course, not to say that Herodotus was directly aware of the Susa foundation texts, which were composed in languages Herodotus did not know, Old Persian, Elamite, and Akkadian, and which are only attested in copies found at Susa. As Margaret Root has noted, however, the multiplicity and even the format of those copies, together with their propagandist message, suggests that, uh, quote, the DSF text was meant to be read, end quote, by a wider audience than that of a foundation deposit proper, which would be buried in the ground. 
These excellent traces of an impetus to broadcast this material, material encourage us to entertain the possibility that at least an echo of its message may have rippled out as far as the Greek periphery. The relationship between the Susa Foundation texts and the monumental palace whose creation they record may help to elucidate the Greek stereotype according to which Persian kings commemorate what they have and or control instead of uh, what they accomplish. Texts like the Susa Foundation would appear to obviate this stereotype in as much as they emphasize the completed past tense deeds of kings and sometimes the doing as much as any specific deed. So for example, the Susa text situates its narrative narrated chart of regional contributions between broad statements that the king has gotten things done. That which I did, I did it all by the greatness of Hara Mazda. Much that was excellent was done. A trilingual inscription on Darius's tomb at Nakshiristan likewise insists on the king's effort and accomplishment. That which has been done, I did it all by the greatness of Ahura Mazda. Ahura Mazda bore me eight until I had done the work. Uh, the Byzantine inscription spends by far the most time narrating the king's deeds, which are repeatedly framed as what Darius did by the greatness of, her, of Ahura Mazda in one and the same year after he became king. And in the Scythian epilogue of the inscription, what Darius did in the second and third year after he became king. When the deeds narrated in the texts are read against the messages projected by the iconography oops, and ceremonial functions of the monuments themselves, however, it appears that they subordinate what Jan Osman would call the hot memory of specific deeds as events, like the act of building a specific monument, to the service of the programmatic formative cold memory, which those monuments construct and perpetuate. It is as though the past tense records of deeds have an explanatory and ultimately stated function in the imperial ideology of Pax Persica, Persian peace, which the corresponding monuments broadcast. The resultative state informed by these deeds is an idealized and binding present tense with future tense ambitions that codifies and affirms the king's continuous control over subject peoples and imperial resources. The monument's programmatic images of enduring order of a stable and timeless system of hierarchical relationships between the king and the objects of empire could perhaps be reinterpreted and stereotyped as the sort of hubristic commemorations of present states of wealth and imperiousness, which appear in Herodotus and in other Greek historiography of Persian kings. I hope to have hinted at some of the ways in which Herodotus, as a Greek historian of Persia, received, experimented with, and demonstrated problems with a committed imperial historiography. It remains for another day to consider the implications of this engagement for the origins of history writing among the Greeks and especially Hecateus and Herodotus. All the same, I encourage us to contemplate historiography and its technologies as a medium between Greece and Persia. Thank you so much for your time and attention.